It's like you're a blank canvas mm. and you're painting yourself with clothes. Some days you feel certain ways, so you paint certain ways with mm-hmm. your clothing. Like you may grab that striped shirt and put it on with the polka dot shorts. Yes. But, you know, people might go, ooh, that's awful. But not to you or in a magazine, the exact look because someone saw you on the street in it. Oh. But you did it because it was your style. And you know what? I think it always works out for the best to have your own style. And even designers. You think about different designers over the years, and they definitely have their own style. They have their look. They just have their look. Wow. My advice is create your look. Create what makes you happy. Don't listen to anyone else. I know you have to listen to the people that you work for if you have a job, but right. how to work, <laughs> do your thing. Do your thing. Patrick McDonald, also notoriously known as the New York Dandy, is an American fashion icon who inspires us with his impeccable style. From the bold ensemble, sophisticated tailoring, and always featuring a signature hat, Patrick's style is unlike any other and one that is bound to inspire. Patrick's life is as fascinating as his incomparable fashion. And just you wait, I could literally talk to him for hours. Fortunately, I had the honor of chatting with Patrick about his early inspirations, building a fashion career in New York City in the 1970s, hello Studio 54, along with some jaw-dropping fashion moments that he experienced throughout his life. I mean, it's, it's amazing. An undeniable tastemaker and a Bill Cunningham favorite, Patrick McDonald will always be the dandy we all know and love. Check out his fascinating story. I am so thrilled that you are here and I am so excited to have you on the show. Well, thank you. How are you? Well, thank you so much. I'm very good, thank you. It's a little hot today. Yes. I'm ready for the fall. You know, I'm I'm curious, what what does the dandy wear on a warm day? <laughs> well, you know what? I used to never go without a jacket. And I've just learned to figure that out <laughs> and not wear a jacket because I was uptown the other day and I had a jacket on and I was just, I was wringing wet. I I just couldn't handle it. But uh, you know what? I wear, I've kind of, um, I had a friend, he was a fashion illustrator. His name was Kenneth Paul Block. Mm -hmm. And fabulous illustrator, actually. And and he was a dandy. And he always wore, it was dapper with the jackets and everything. But in the summer, he had kind of a uniform. He wore skinny, uh, like khaki pants or white Mm -hmm. pants Mm -hmm. with a white linen shirt and a little scarf around his neck when it was weather like this. So Love it's it. quite a good look, but I do that. And also I add something else. I've been adding in these kind of French striped t-shirts and today Ooh. actually it's so hot. I have like a skinny white pant with a red and white striped t-shirt. It's a little tunicky with slits oh. up the side, a scarf in the neck, the round glasses and a little cotton cap. I That's Love it. it. I love it. That's I actually want to wear look. that. Everybody always, <laughs> everybody always says to me, why are you so dressed up? And I'm like, well, not really. <laughs> it's like, hello. <laughs> <laughs> this is life. This is life. Well, I I cannot wait to get into your life and, and amazing career. Wow. Like, I oh, mean, it's just mind blowing. And, and you are such an iconic figure to to not only New York, well, but really I appreciate the world. that. So but, thank you. Well, I don't, I, 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 I don't appreciate that, but I don't. I, I I like to be a little more humble, and and uh, I, I I do know certain people know who I am, but but you know it's okay. Well, it, we it's, fashion it's okay. fans know. We fashion fans well, know. <laughs> <laughs> so I have to yeah. ask you, what was it like growing up in San Luis? Obispo. I had no idea you were from California. I'm from Colton, which is in San Bernardino oh, County. I know nothing there. Yes, yes. There. Well, actually, I wasn't born in California. Oh. Uh, I'll start where I was born, and I'll make it quick. I was born in Ger- Heidelberg, Germany. Uh, and I have a twin brother, Michael. My father was in the military, 
And my parents lived in Europe. They lived in Heidelberg, which where that's where the military base was. But they didn't live at the base. They lived off the base. Wow. And uh, we were born there. And uh, we lived there to we're just a little, not quite a year old. And uh, what's funny is that fast forward many years, I went to Pepperdine in Malibu Love in it. the uh, 70s. And their Europe uh, year exchange program was in Heidelberg, where I was born. So it's so funny that I went back all these years later, never, never, years later, never think I'd go back there. And I went there, I lived there a year, which was great. But uh, so back to, okay, born in Heidelberg, uh, funny story. My grandmother came over to visit from San Luis Obispo, you know, via New York to Mm -hmm. Germany. And my parents picked her up. She took a ship called the Andrea Doria. (laughs) across. It sank on the way back. No. It was a, fa- it was a famous ship that sank. It wow. sank. It was it was hit and it sank. And I think it was hit by another ship and it That's sank. Wild. But other than that, there's photos somewhere. I don't know where they are. I couldn't find them. Uh, my mother and father on a speedboat with my grandmother in the boat <laughs> with Andrea Dora behind them. And I was like, ooh, I wish I had that photo. That but is amazing. We came to- <laughs> We became uh, American citizens when we were about, my brother and I, when we were about seven. It just happens that way. I wish I had dual citizenship, but I don't. And we came to this country on a ship called the SS United States, which was traveled by many fabulous people, as I found out when I was older. I was a year old on the ship. It left from Hamburg, Germany, to New York. And on board that crossing was Salvatore Dali and... Rosano Brazzi, the uh, actor that was in Summertime wow. with Catherine Hepburn, one of my favorite movies, but also who took the ship all the time, well, Marlon Brando had taken it, but all the time was the Duke and Duchess of Windsor traveled wow. by that ship a lot, a lot. And Dolly did too, Salvador Dolly did too. So, But years later, it's it's in dry dock in Pennsylvania, in Philadelphia, and I went to see the ship so, Amazing. Uh, about three years ago. And it looked quite tiny compared to what I thought it was going to be. Hmm. And it was all kind of a ghost ship now, rusty with no windows. And it was kind wow. of creepy. But I thought to myself, I was on that ship with Salvatore Dali. How fast? Well, that was the wow. beginning. And what's so funny is this, is that my brother and I were born, share the same birthday as Salvatore Dali, May 11th. Stop. Oh, my God. That's so crazy. Maybe, he had his kooky mustache. <laughs> and I have my kooky <laughs> eyebrows. I so love something it. Rubbed off. <laughs> something rubbed off for sure. I love it. You know, when did you first fall in love with fashion and just, you know, like you have impeccable style? Like when did it begin? Well, kind of going back to growing up in San Luis Obispo is not a very fashionable town for sure. But yeah. my grandfather had a uh, men's haberdashery there called Wickenden's, and it was all English clothing and uh, quite fabulous. I never knew him. He died uh, when my mother was quite young, mm. but the store carried on till I was a child and was run by different people owned by my mother. But uh, what happened, how I got into loving fashion was my mother loved, was born in San Francisco, loved going to Beverly Hills or San Francisco as we were kids. Love. You know, we, she'd take us to the theater. I think uh, one of the first shows I saw was uh, Auntie Mame with Rosalind Russell. No way. Uh, Not Rosalind Russell, excuse me, with Angela Lansbury in San Francisco. But she used to take us to uh, I Magnon was a big store then, uh, Saxon Avenue, uh, Bullock's Wilshire and Beverly Hills on Wilshire. Wow. So she really took us and showed us fashion. Mm. And then when we were in 1967, I was 11 years old, and my mother took my twin brother, and I have a half-brother, older brother, uh, the three of us to Europe for the summer. My Mm. father was working. My father was out of the military, and just getting out of the military, was going into real estate. And so I guess they must have needed a break, but we went for about two two or three months to Europe. We started out in 1967 in London. Well, first New York, Mm -hmm. and then going to Bergdorf Goodman, of course, for the first time. And then from there, going to London. In 1967, London was at the peak 
of the swinging 60s and what was going on in London. I knew who Twiggy was. I was wow. 11 years old. Loved the Beatles. We stayed for two weeks at the Grosvenor House in London. And um, that was, was uh, kind of go back a little bit. My mother came from a little bit of money, so she liked to mm-hmm. travel, right? So that was great for us. But yeah, so we were at the Grosvenor House. And during that first two weeks in Europe, I'd been in Europe as a baby, but not as, you know, a young dandy of 11, being able to experience things. I wasn't seven or eight either. I was old enough to appreciate. So we were in London. I mean, my mother took us, of course, to Biba, which was (laughs) fabulous, and to Harrods, and we experienced who Ozzy Clark was, the designer, and and all these people, and, and, you know, going to Carnaby Street to Lord John, and, and uh, I got my first Nehru jacket there, and, and just loving, you know, I love the flamboyantness of men's fashion in the 60s. Mm. I love the ruffles, I love the prints, I loved all that. Going forward, in Europe that summer, we were in Paris, we went to Courrèges, my mother shopped there. But the big treat my mother was looking forward to is we were in Florence, Italy, and we were there for about two weeks. And we went to the Pucci Palace. <gasps> and my mother was bought Pucci. She was into Pucci. It was crazy. Oh, my God. But we met Emilio Pucci. I remember being a little twin sitting on a little uh, settee as my mother was shown clothing. And she bought a few things. And Emilio Pucci came out. Oh. And I remember that as a little boy. Amazing. And, uh but he was dapper. I, I think that he's he's either a count or a baron. I'm not sure. But mm. it was just elegant. I mean, I remember specifically the interior of uh, the palazzo. It was it was really over the top, and that I fell in love with with chandeliers, darling, and, and taffeta and uh. draperies that puddled on the floor, and and beautiful clothes, and and just you know, it was a whole new world that my mother did open up for my brother and I. And then from that day on, from that trip on, I just loved clothes. I mean, I would, oh, before I went to Pepperdine in 1974 wow. to school, to college, I, oh, my, my, we'd still go to Beverly Hills and we'd shop at a store called Jerry Magnum, my, my favorite. And uh, I got familiar with Ralph Lauren. And it was wow. so funny. Ralph Lauren had a little boutique on the side of Jerry Magnum, it was a department, and I did a trunk show, and I wish I still had, I had my name on the inside, on the label. I ordered a jacket, and they, I could pick whatever fabric I wanted, my father paid for it. He said, you can have it for school, and he thought I'd get a blue blazer or something. I didn't get a blue blazer. Guess what I picked? I picked burlap. No! I actually oh, that is fabulous. Burlap unlined burlap that was ticking on the inside. Even the rep said, are you sure? Yeah, especially unlined. It was very very stiff. And I got it. But you know what? It broke in. It was fabulous. I lived in that jacket. Oh, my goodness. I'd wear that with like a white shirt unbuttoned, (sighs) you know, and and, and like no one. Well, I did wear jeans. When I was in college, I did wear jeans. I I did wear that unlined. Uh, but not a lot. I wore more cotton pants. I did wear bell bottoms, though. I love I it. Wore the most, I wore elephant bell bottoms. Wow. And I wore platform shoes from a place called Nunbush, uh, the brass boot on Rodeo Drive, which made extraordinary shoes. And so did Fred Slatten on Sunset Boulevard. That's where Elton and wow. Sharon and everybody got their platforms. And I, without letting my father know, I saved all my pennies <laughs> or my mother know. And I could get platforms. They knew I had them. <laughs> But they were they were like the more the modest, like a brown lace up or a yeah. tone in beige, you know, or a wedge, you know, that was more neutral. I could have those and more like an inch and a half, two inch platform, not the high ones. Right. I saved up and I bought electric blue ostrich <gasps> platforms. And they had like a three inch platform with like a oh four inch heel or whatever it was. They were fabulous. And I wore them with I wore them with elephant bell bottoms in pale yellow, high waisted, and I wore a shirt that was like tie dyed, that only was so tight that it only buttoned one button at the waist. And I had this clear glitter belt in red, clear glitter with clear with glitter inside in red. Love. And I wore that with it. So of course, 
uh, my oh, shag, oh my I'm shag hairdo. Shag to the, uh, to the long, <laughs> super long. And I was a groupie. I mean, my friend Gordon in college, we would go shopping. And finally, my father took, I had a house charge at Cherry Magnet. My father finally took it away because every Friday we <laughs> didn't have class. So I'd go in and have lunch at Beverly Hills and just buy whatever I wanted, which my Amazing. father said, you don't need enough. But uh, I remember Gordon and I like being groupies. And that's where I met Andy Warhol wow. during those days in, in um, Beverly Hills. And also uh, just the actress seeing, I mean, it wasn't, there was no TMZ, TMZ following people around. There was yeah. no uh, cell phones, no paparazzi chasing people around. So you were right there. Beverly Hills was a village where I'd go in the 60s and the 70s. It was more of like, you know, there were a lot of stores, but not like what it is today. There were designer stores, but not at all. There wow. were more like privately owned stores, like Right Bank Clothing Company. There was Jack's, and he owned the Daisy, which was across the street. And then there was restaurants, too, a lot of restaurants on Rodale. Uh, wow. There was the Luau, and there was uh, Cafe Swiss, and there was a lot of different places. It was different then. It, yeah. it was really different then, but there were great shops with unusual clothing. I discovered Ralph Lauren there. I discovered Mod Free Zone there from France. I had fabulous uh, uh, gold metallic boots from them. Oh, my and goodness. And then I called College was over and I, I moved to New York. I, I knew I had to move to New York. Well, you know, what did you actually study at Pepperdine? I was wondering. Uh, shopping. <laughs> <laughs> was Being it something bad. like business or like pre-law or like oh, your parents? Well, oh, are you kidding me? <laughs> I chose Pepperdine because they recruited me. Now it's a hard school to get into. Yeah. There was a very, very small student body when I was. Started. I have lifelong friends I met that I wow. still see and love. But I have to tell you, I studied art. The art department love. was made of about 20 people, the art department, wow. 20. There wasn't even a classroom for it. They had these like huts on the, by, not even off campus a little bit. So we <laughs> studied there. And I, and I shouldn't be saying this, but I remember one of my teachers, I remember what this one guy that I became friends with in the class, his parents lived in Bel Air. Mm-hmm. Oh, kid, okay, in a mansion. So wow. he had an affair with the teacher. <gasps> what? Scandalous. And so it was scandalous, but no, nothing happened back then. Yeah. But we all go on. The teacher would take us, no class on Friday, but on Thursday, she would take us to Alice's restaurant for margaritas. I was Stop. <laughs> for margaritas. I love it. I cannot. I'm sure it was helpful, like just learning the history, oh, like art fabulous. history oh, and yeah. delving into oh, yeah. all of that. Do you have a favorite well, like I, era? Well, well, you know what? Not really. Yeah. <laughs> I yeah. like fashion design. I really wanted to. I mean, they were very up to doing what we wanted to at school, especially in the art department. I mean, we could, we'd go to the Getty Museum when it was in wow. Malibu and sit and, and sketch on the lawn or or and I always wanted to. They were trying to arrange for me to go to uh, to the studios. I wanted to meet Edith Head. <laughs> I love and, it. Uh, yes, and I think they were really going to do it, and, and it did, somehow it didn't happen. But um, wow. years later, I remember I was speaking to Bob Mackie, and Bob Mackie told me that he worked with Edith Head, which was wow. interesting at the beginning of his career, which was great. But I love fashion design. I liked everything fashion. I not design, but illustration is what mm. I loved. And um, I don't know. I just liked having. I, I was free. I finally, when I when I went away to school, um, and I drove into uh, Mal to Pepperdine in Malibu, and I saw. I, I picked the right place for sure because yeah. it was there was no traffic then. It was twenty minutes into Beverly Hills. It was wow. easy to go go out at night and, and Alice's <laughs> restaurant in Malibu and Crazy Your Saloon and. And and I'd seen the Rolling Stones at Crazy Your Saloon or seeing whoever lived there. Cary Grant was one of the first people I saw when I was there. I opened my first bank account at the Bank of America <laughs> outside the colony, and he was there. Amazing. And, and it was always <laughs> that kind of sightings constantly. And seeing and emulating and emulating. Wow. Because you know what? I was a kid, even though I learned a lot through my mother, I was away on my own. And I was, it was, I was like a kid in a candy store. So I would see Carrie, you know, around Malibu in a tennis outfit with a sweater tied around his shoulders. I love it. Hey, I'm going to tie my shoulder, my sweater around my shoulders. Oh my God. 
just all that kind of thing was really influenced me. I am like living through your entire, like your entire childhood, like college. I mean, the stories you have, I'm sure they're like, like, I mean, you can't even count. Oh yeah. There were some, (laughs) there were some, there were some good ones. There were some good ones, but I, 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 uh, I I don't know. I just I I moved to New York and yes, uh, in the 70s. Actually, I I did. I moved to New York in 1978. Wow. I graduated in 78 in this in uh, uh, early summer from Pepperdine, and uh, then I moved in September. Wow. And uh, I I didn't know what I was going to do. Actually, believe it or not, I I modeled a little bit in Los Angeles. And so I had a portfolio of pictures and I, I, I pounded the pavement thinking this would be a good job. I mean, I love GQ. My mother uh, uh, subscribed to uh, GQ for my brother and I when we were in high school and Esquire. So we had GQ and it was amazing GQ. I mean, all the big names, all the big models, Pat Cleveland. I remember having one with Pat Cleveland on the wow. cover. And I would see just these people and my mother actually, what was the best is my mother subscribed to Interview Magazine. And this was when it was folded over. And I think it was like 50 cents. Wow. And I wish I had them all still. And uh, I just saw, you know, sketches by Antonio Lopez. And I mm-hmm. saw Nightlife. The studio wasn't open yet because I was coming to New York. It just had opened. But when I saw Interview in high school, it wasn't open yet. There were other clubs and they, were, they had sketches of, of people in Paris at Club Sept and at Regimes and everywhere else. And I just knew I had to be part of New York because uh, I had to be. Yeah. I felt comfortable when I looked at those pictures. I felt like, this is for me. It's for me. And uh, I moved to New York. And I my first job I got was at C. Rucci and, uh, on 59th Street. Wow. And I met Joey Arias, which was still lifelong friends. But the, it was um, I met Ilya Fiorucci. He came once. He came a few times where I met him once. And just opened up doors. I mean, uh, Fiorucci was like a nightclub during the day. Wow. And then it, even more, I learned more about fashion and, and designers in New York and, and finding out who different people were. Stephen Burroughs, wow. amazing. And I became yeah. friends with him later. And and uh, the history of him and, and O Boutique and the Let Us Leave Him and, and uh, Aegon von Furstenberg and Diane von Furstenberg and Calvin Klein. And actually, it's funny, I went to a trunk show for Calvin Klein when I was in college. I met (laughs) Calvin and he was really young. Calvin was really young and wanted to know something really funny. Aegon von Furstenberg was married to Diane during that time. And Aegon had a men's collection and he had a trunk (sighs) show at Joseph Magnus at Century City. And I went on my own Wow! and I, I met him and I bought a suit that I wore to my college graduation. Oh, wow. That's amazing. And I, wore it the, and I re-wore that same suit to the first time I went to Studio 54. Ugh. I was but going then to the ask. Look changed, darling. <laughs> the look changed, because The look changed because I told my father, I, I, I have a job, and I really, I had a lot of clothes already, but I need, like, some serious suits and, a, like, a, a overcoat, and I need all this stuff I'm not used So he, you know, I, I had a charge card, so he extended the limit and let me, you know, spent a certain amount of money. And guess what I did? I hmm. went immediately to Henry Bendel ah. because <laughs> I met Geraldine Stutz through a friend. Wow. And because um, I went there for a job interview, actually. Mm-hmm. Uh, to, not a job interview, but to meet her to see where I should work. And I got a job at Fiorucci, so I took that instead. But I ended up buying my first Barry Kieselstein cord belt there. And wow. It was well, $300. That was a lot then. Um, yes. I went around the corner. <laughs> I went around the corner to Kamali and bought a sleeping bag coat because I no. thought Stevie Bell had one. <gasps> so I thought if I, and you know what? The sleeping bag coat, <sighs> the, the Kiesel's team cord belt. Then I had my just kind of food, which I bought a few pairs. Of, I bought leather skinny pants. I bought a pair of riding boots from Charles Jordan and a few silk shirts. And then my budget was blown. Wow. It was done and finished. And I, every penny I, I had, and I earned a few, which, which was not a lot, $125 a week take home wow. was not a lot. My share of the rent was $122, $118 um, a month. Wow. So 
that, that's what you had to, you were supposed to do. You're supposed to cover your rent in yeah. one week's paycheck. Now that doesn't work. It takes three weeks paycheck. <laughs> right. <laughs> but um, it's crazy. It's wow. crazy. But every every penny I got, I'd save. And I'd see that when uh, Susan Bennett and Warren Edwards, they had a shop called Chelsea Cobbler first before they opened Susan Bennett and Warren Edwards. And I got my first pair of, of their shoes there, uh, like a low vamp little shoe to wear to studio. But um, I saved every penny. I didn't eat. I was so wow. skinny. It was unbelievable. I remember having like my budget was a dollar. We a dollar. Some of us fashion folks a, have been there. So we have sacrificed for, food for fashion. <laughs> so you had a choice. Yeah. And it was you go to Yamabella with my friend Tim that I worked with, uh, a few blocks up off Madison. Wow. And it's not there anywhere, but it was fabulous. You could get two slices and a, I got a tab. A tab instead of Coke, a mm-hmm. tab for one dollar, and I'd go there for one dollar. <laughs> or you could go across the street to the Benmore Coffee Shop. We'd all get there before eleven o'clock. It was a ninety-nine cent breakfast special. No way! So we all pile in and eat, <laughs> and it, and you could eat as much as you wanted. Wow! Because we we're the last ones in the waitress bunny that we knew would bring the extra leftover bacon and just pluck it on the table Amazing. with the extra toast and everything. And we just eat and gorge. I never gained a pound. Amazing. Eat and gorge because that was your big meal for the day. Wow. Cause you may not eat again. Wow. Cause you, you had to, you had to, you had to get, you had to add to the outfit for that night at studio or mud club. You, you had to get something new or you had to get that eyeliner. That's you, amazing. You had to. How would you describe Studio 54 and the significance and impact that it had on New York at that time? Well, I think that what I can, from a personal uh, standpoint and from a personal view, Mm -hmm. uh, all I remember is the first time I went, uh, I was in a taxi uh, going up, uh, was it 8th? Is it, was it between 7th and 8th? I think so. 54th, 7th and 8th. And I was turning the corner on 54th Street, mm-hmm. and there was there was a crowd like swollen up under the street. So I had to get off on the corner, wow. and there was this outrageous energy. I can't even describe the energy wow. that it just had. I, I I I could I know it. I know it well. And actually, uh, not long ago, I went with Lauren Azerski. We mm-hmm. went by the theater something was playing there and now I think it showed cabaret. I, I saw cabaret there and some other things go on there, but we walked into the entrance just for all time's sake and it hadn't wow. changed. It looked wow. the same, but I still got that feeling. Wow. It still was there and I can't, and other people that went know what I'm talking about, Yeah, but there was some sort of energy there that was just magical. Mm-hmm. I, I can't even tell you it was an, you know, it was the pick and choose, but that was only because they had to because of, you know, the fire department, because it was yeah. so popular that they had to limit the capacity. And then Steve Rubell did pick, you know, certain people here and there and the celebrities and, and, and the different people at the time, you know, that were known would go in. I always got in. I was lucky. And, uh, and then later I uh, met Mark Penneke. Uh, he was a friend of it. Uh, his neighbor was a friend of mine, and wow. uh, that I knew through uh, uh, my roommate. And um, so we never, we always got in, and it was great. But it was just you walk in, and you just, it was, and I those days I didn't, I mean, everybody said it was so like Sodom and Gomorrah. It wasn't to me. It was hmm. like, it was the most freeing place I'd ever been. I could be myself, wow. I could dress the way I wanted to dress. I could, you know, uh, I could be next to Halston or a Margaret Trudeau or whoever was there, yeah. Elton John, and it wasn't segregated. Wow. It wasn't at all. We all were, it was a mix, and Steve did a great, it was all in the mix. I mean, there were places that people sat where they always sat, and you didn't right. sit over there, but it didn't matter. If, if, if Liza got up to dance, she was dancing next to you. It, it just wasn't, it was just. It was a freeing time. Plus, I loved to watch and see what everybody was wearing. Yes. Because, you know, people <laughs> did did do their thing. And it yeah. wasn't, 
It wasn't a sweatsuit, darling. Mm-mm. There were people wearing sweatsuits there. No, no. They're, 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 they were not. I mean, there were people that did dress casual. There were, you know, certain people that, you know, might wear it next to nothing, yep. which was fine, uh, which was great. If you can and you had the body, go for it. Some didn't, but they went for it anyway. <laughs> but um, but I saw everyone there. I, I mean, that's where you really learned and, and you saw. I mean, uh, I met Fabrice there. Wow. Um uh, you know, Chester Berry was there. Mary McFadden was there. Uh, every hairdresser in town was there. Every model was there. Pat Cleveland was there. Uh, you know, everybody. I mean, it's hard to even, it, it's endless. It's endless. Wow. It wasn't, it just, everybody was there and they were having a good time. Uh, the music, I still, it's my favorite music. I'm sorry. People say, say disco sucks. <laughs> You're like disco they forever. Can, you know, disco does not <laughs> suck. If you really listen to it, they cannot even repeat the songs or do it the way they did it back then. The no. orchestration of this music was unbelievable. Unbelievable. Wow. I mean, I saw, I, I saw performers there. I saw um, Marvin Gaye there. Wow. And he was amazing. It's a uh, few years into going to studio Mm-hmm. He had come out with a song called Sexual Healing. And I'll never wow. forget that he had this bridge they had built, and it came across uh, the dance floor, the bridge, and he was on it singing <gasps> Sexual Healing. He was dressed so nicely in this in a tuxedo. He was so handsome, and the oh song was so great. And you know, it was things like that. <sighs> it's just like you didn't, you'd go there and you didn't know what, like Dinah Ross would be in the DJ booth or, or Cher would be there, or you just didn't know. You just <sighs> didn't know from one time. And I went, I went at least twice a week, sometimes three times a week. Amazing. And I worked and I'd get home at four in the morning or five. And there were times I'd get home in the morning and I'd have enough time to shower and go to work. Yep. Yep. But you weren't tired. Well, I, I was 22. Yeah, that describes my, my first two years in New York as well. <laughs> you know, Just getting and the I lay of the land. <laughs> so where where did you but, work? Like, where, where were some of the first places that you worked? Like, where did your career start? Okay. okay. Well, it started at Fiorucci. And I, I worked there for uh, uh, under two years. Wow. But I, I met met my uh, friend, I uh, became friends with a guy named Arthur Williams and his partner, Lauren Becker. Mm-hmm. And they lived in a building called the Maurice mm-hmm. on 58th Street, which I did end up moving into. And uh, not with them. Mm-hmm. But uh, I wish I still had that apartment. It was fabulous. <laughs> had a fireplace. Oh, my God. It was right between six Pictures. and seven. It was a block, a block from the plaza. Wow. Oh my God, I, I looked up how much that apartment is now. I can't even tell you. That's amazing. I met the owner. And you know what? I saw the apartment. I said I'd take it. I gave him a check for two months for it, and I got the keys. That's how I wow. got it. From. That's wow. what you did. That's what you did. People trusted everybody. <laughs> what a time. Kid. But, okay. <laughs> On to the work situation. I went from Fiorucci. And again, my friend Lauren and Arthur they were opening a shop called Bellocchio Womo. On mm-hmm. Madison Avenue, at the beginning when Madison started becoming a fashion street. And it was 69th and Madison next to a shop called Tony Anton. I think where the location is now is became Dolce Gabbana. Ah. And they opened a little mid store, 300 square feet. And they hired me and because I was friends with them. And it was wonderful. It was wow. tiny. It was done by Carl Springer. The furniture was all Carl Springer. And it was, uh, they, carry, they carried four men's wear designers. They carry all European. They carried uh, Gianfranco Ferre for men. Oh my they goodness, yes. John, Gianmarco Venturi, wow. Laura Biagiati, Cashmere's, and they carried uh, Versace. Wow. They were the first ones to carry Versace. And um, might not have been the first close. I think maybe Barney's downtown could have at the same time. I'm not sure. Mm-hmm. I don't quote me on that one, but uh, they did carry it and they added up town. But it was, they were great friends. We socialized together. We went to uh, clubs together. We worked together. Wow. We had a great clientele. Women too bought the cashmere. They'd come in with their husband. But I mean, for instance, Rudolf Nureyev would come in. Wow. And people like that would come in. And it was just wonderful. 
And I learned a lot from Arthur too. And I learned a lot. I learned about, you know, mixing patterns and I'll never forget. You're going to love this. <laughs> when Donna Vreeland came out with her book, GZ, yes. there was a bookstore between 69th and 70th called Matt on the same side of the street as Bellocchio called Madison Avenue bookstore owned by a guy named Arthur. I forget his last name from a very wealthy family. And he owned this bookstore. And I used to go in here and there and they were having a book signing with Diana Freeland. Mm -hmm. And uh, I said to Arthur, uh, I want to run up and get a book. And he goes, go ahead. And I remember that day I was wearing a John Markle Venturi suit. They were very generous to me. They gave to me, but I had, I mixed everything together and he loved it. So I had a bright red fire engine, red wolf suit with black (gasps) stripe and the matching pant. But I had also had a a hound's tooth pant in the same black and red. And I had a bright red shirt and a black red, uh, black shirt and a red shirt, two separate shirts. I'd mix it all together. Oh, she loved that. Two different outfits. Mm -hmm. Yes, I went in my <laughs> shoulder length hair, and I always wore black eyeliner, heavy black eyeliner. Wow. And no glasses, shoulder length hair. Arthur wore a little makeup too. So I uh, wore the, the uh, striped jacket with a houndstooth red pant, uh, a pointy a black pant leather shoes from Bennett and Edwards with, I think, a red sock. And I wore a red Mandarin collar wool shirt. I went in, and she was like, she looked at me, she signed the book, wasn't paying attention to she looked at me, she said, <laughs> and she gave me a look. And it was the end of the day, so I was like the last one there. Yeah. And no one was there. And she goes, more men should dress like you. Yes. And I said, they should. She goes, that is the right shade of red. Oh. Something like that. Something about my red. I love red, or I adore oh red. Oh, my goodness. Red's fabulous, or, you know, j'adore red. I don't know. She just went on about that. <laughs> she goes, more men, more men should wear red. Wow. And she was very nice. And it was, you know, it was, it was quick and we didn't have a long conversation, but it did make my day. Uh, yeah. It did make my day. That's major. And, uh, <laughs> I went back and I told Arthur and Lauren and um, it was nice. It oh was nice. Goodness. And I had the book signed by her and I gave it to my friend Lauren. Lauren wow. has it. Wow. I gave it to her for her birthday. Ah, oh, that is you have so many great stories, you guys. That's why I'm just like, I just want to hear Patrick talk and share like for hours and hours if I could. But, you know, we only have a certain, you know, amount of time with you. And That's I want to get into, <laughs> I mean, honestly, okay. I could do okay. this all day. I could do this all day with okay. you. In a previous interview, so you mentioned your love for Paris. So what do you yes. love most about Paris. And do you still own that YSL purple mohair coat? I don't. (gasps) I don't. I don't own that coat. It was actually, I was in a photograph by Bill Cunningham in that coat and in the window of Bergdorf for the party from a blow of me in that coat. Wow. That coat was a fabulous coat. I don't know what possessed me, but I met someone that was a collector and they were like, they really wanted the coat. And I'd really worn it enough. I'd worn <laughs> yeah. it in Paris. I'd worn it everywhere. And I was like, and I was, I, there was an offer I couldn't refuse. Yeah. And I thought with the offer, I could buy some new things, which I, of course, went out immediately. And of did. course. <laughs> but I, I, I love Paris. I, you know what? When I moved to New York, I can sum it up by saying that when I moved to New York, I knew that there was something there. And I knew that I belonged there. And I knew that just walking on the streets and walking on my own around New York City and exploring that this, that New York was my home. Even if wow. someday I don't live here again, it will we all always be my home. And I had never felt that way about any place else but Paris. Wow. And when I went to Paris, I'd gone with my family. Didn't experience it then, but that summer with my mother, but because I was young, but I went to Paris when I was in college and I just felt it then. And then I started going a lot. And I, last time I was with my friend Nancy, we went for a long weekend and I hadn't been in a, a year or so. And um, I said, Well, we're on the corner of this great cafe. Said, well, how do you know that? You know, <laughs> I just know. You know how you just know, and it was there. And she goes, 
And even to this day, she goes, <laughs> I can't believe how you knew the city. So wow. and there are some fabulous people there. And I met some wonderful people there. Catherine Baba lives there. Uh, Diane Pernay. Wow. Uh, my friend had a club there uh, for a while, which I hosted at. Um, I don't know. I just, even if I'm on my own there, I can never get tired of it. I, I can always find something that I just love. And I'm just like the architecture alone is yes. enough for me. Yeah, It's enough. It's really enough. But you know what? It's, it's, and plus from the street cleaner oh. to the, the wealthiest person in Paris, there's a style, yes. there's a sense of style. There's definitely a sense of style that's strictly Parisian. Yes. That may not exist other places in France, but it, it does exist in Paris. And um, I do miss it. I haven't gone now because of the pandemic. Yeah. But hopefully too. next year sometime I'll go. Yes. And my favorite little places. And uh, I like, and you know what I like too? Hmm. The lighting. There's, well, it's the city of lights, but the, the lighting. That's so interesting. Really, I've never paid lighting. attention to it's that. the lighting. Wow. And especially at, at night. It's the lighting at night. It's hmm. an amber light that yeah. exists on the streets. It's amber. Wow. It's not the lighting we have here. No. It's not at all that. It's amber. It's this romantic lighting that it could be, you could be standing on an empty street. And I used to do that. I used to walk from the club at three in the morning when I'd host or two in the morning. And I walked down an empty street and it was the street could have been the, lit the same, you know, 150 years before wow. or a hundred years before it. It just has this special thing. And I like and It's the lighting. It I love it. And you look good. And you look good in it. Right. Everybody looks good in it. <laughs> My pictures came out great. Like they come out great every time. And I never, I never paid attention to that. Wow. That's amazing. It, it's what it is. It's the lighting. Well, you have had several looks throughout your life and you've shared <laughs> some of them, which we love. How yes. did you craft your style as the dandy of New York? And where, like, where did you get that name? Okay, well, <laughs> there's, been a, there's been a lot of different articles written saying that uh, self-proclaimed or, or you, know, you know, dandy or whatever, just, yeah. it was never self-proclaimed. I never said that about myself. Someone, you know who said it about me was I.K. Ude, the Nigerian artist, called me a dandy. Wow. And he used to call me a dandy. He said, when people ask you, who, you know, I'd say dandy. And that's, you know, if they ask you what you do. I just say, I'm a dandy. It's just easier than explaining it. everything. <laughs> and that's how it happened. And that's what it is. But my look was taken from many different places. Wow. Um, the whole eyebrow thing, which I can't tell you how many people wanted to change them over the years, wow. thinking, oh, my God. And then and even close friends coming up to going, oh, my God. And, you know, people say, ask me, why, why, why do I make them? Why do I have us? Because I don't want to be like everybody else. And I like, it and I do it for me. Yeah. And that's it. In one sentence. I do it for me. And, um, I'm sure I've lost out on a lot of different things because of it. But now that time has passed and it's something that wasn't accepted is now perfectly accepted. Yeah. And, um, but I still, I didn't start it. I mean, I, I've worn it for years. I've worn the eyebrows and the makeup, but they were definitely influenced. The, the eye makeup was influenced by uh, Elizabeth Taylor, who I met oh, through Jose Bear. Yes. And the beauty mark we have in the same place, which we did discuss, <gasps> she and I. I love it. Uh, oh my God. You know, the, uh, the, the whole eye makeup thing with, with uh, you know, seeing silent screen stars like Rudolph Valentino, they all wore makeup. Wow. They all wore heavy shadow. Yeah. They always had that, that look. And and I love that look. And of course, Bowie and, and mm -hmm. even Alice Cooper, you know, when I was in high school and loving Bowie when I was in college, uh, still do. And uh, just, you know, the freedom of the, the wearing the makeup and, and of course, the Rocky Horror Picture Show. Yeah. You know, uh, the artist that, uh, what is his name? I wish I could. He always slips my mind who did the makeup for it, but he was... Um, it's 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 online who did it, but I, I know 
I, he's quite extraordinary. He did the makeup for the Rocky Horror Picture Show. And wow. that was a big influence, too. Definitely Ugh. a big influence about men in makeup and, and, and doing what you want to do. And, and you know what? I, I, I believe that it's an enhancement and some people don't. And I, I don't believe that it makes it masculine or feminine. I think yeah. that, you know, and that's why you see now, uh, you know, you know, they're, they're fluid. Men are yes. wearing nail polish. I wore nail polish years ago. I wore yep. nail polish years ago. I used to wear either black nail polish or white nail polish. Wow. And I used to wear that to fashion week and people were like, Ooh, really? right. And, uh, <laughs> you know, but, uh, but you know what? I know some of the young kids want to take credit for the, all the, the ginger fluid stuff, but I didn't consider that the name of who I was. I wasn't, yeah. I don't think I was ginger fluid. I was just, I was Patrick. You were just doing your thing. I was being, I was doing my thing. I was doing it. And, and did, I didn't want to look like a girl and I didn't want to look like this one or that one. I wanted to look like me. Yeah. And when I looked in the mirror, I liked, I liked it. I liked the, the shape of the eyebrows. Everybody made fun of them. Wow. You know, they made fun of them. They, they thought, oh my God, they're so crazy. <laughs> I mean, they, they got to a point of like touching my, uh, my sideburns and I, they were like, oh, oh no. they're, they're crazy. I go, well, well, you said that about Diana Vreeland's blush? Hmm. Hmm. Yeah, she used to put blush on her ears. <laughs> <laughs> I love it. You know, where and and when did you start integrating the hats? Oh, well, I learned that from my friend Jose Ebert, the hairdresser. Oh. oh, I always had a great thick head of hair long. And as I got older, luckily not until around 40. Mm-hmm. I started getting thinner and thinner and, you know, the hairline. I just didn't want to do the whole rigmarole and yeah. everything else. So I, I brought the hat into play, which I love the hat. And, um, and it just, you know, it became like the cherry on a Sunday. Yes. <laughs> you know, how many hats do you so, have? Like how many do you currently own? Oh gosh. Oh, I don't know. <laughs> not, not, I, I, I got rid of some, you know, I actually, uh, some hats were given to a few museums oh, and uh, wow. I also uh, first did, did a whole thing on my hats. Wow. They did. They did. But I, uh, I, I don't know. I, I don't know. A lot. I have a lot. I've <laughs> actually, I have less structured hats than I use. I used to have more structured hats. Now I have wow. more caps, caps and fezes and, and cloches and things like that. I love I have it. bags full of those. I love I'm always, it. My brother says to me, why do you need another one? Well, it's not like that one. <laughs> so I get another one. But you, I'm never going to be without a hat. You know, you mentioned Bill Cunningham capturing some yeah. of your looks. Is there yeah. like, is there a moment that you recall with him where you're just like, wow, that was a great moment with Bill. Do you have a favorite? I do. <sighs> to me, Bill is just, and I think Alaya, as in Alaya. Yeah. Similar quote or similar thing. He said, Bill is the smartest man in fashion. And he was the smartest man in fashion. He would deny that completely, but he was. He knew everything, every stitch, every button, every collection. He knew it. Wow. And uh, he was, you could, everybody could learn so much from Bill, as Anna Winter said in the film. Yeah. But uh, my special moment is this with Bill. I'd, I'd see Bill all the time, but on one particular day, I saw him near his bike, and we were, I came up and we were chatting, mm-hmm. and he was on his way somewhere, and he looked at his, a little, he pulled out of his pocket a little watch, and it was a ladybug, a little wow. cheapy watch he told me from China Club, but the wings you press, and they opened, and it was a, it was a watch, and um, I said, well, that's a great watch. Oh, it's nothing, <laughs> and I said, oh, it's great. He goes, I go, well, you must fly because it's a ladybug. And he kind of smiled. He got wow. on his bike. And it was just before fashion week. He said, I'll see you at fashion week. And I said, I will. And wow. um, Bill made my day every time I'd see Bill. And I lived on 56th Street on the east side. And he lived on 56th in Carnegie Apartments. And I worked on 57th Street wow. for John Anthony after Fabrice. And so I would naturally see Bill all the time. People would always say to me, well, you must chase him down to be in the paper as much as you want. I said, that's such a rude thing to say. I, yeah. I walk on the street every day to work. That's how I go to work. I go to work. I wow. go to work that way. I go to lunch that way. I go home that way. But uh, other than that, 
I went to Fashion Week, which was probably less than a week later. And he, I saw him all week. And he'd say, where are you going? And he'd snap some pictures. And he said, what do you think of this? And this and that. And then, wow. you know, and he looked me up and down and snapped the <laughs> shoes and run off or snap the hat <laughs> and then go. And, you know, this or that. And, and, you know, and if he didn't snap you, you know, not crazy about this. Outfit right. Today. Right. But, um, <laughs> but it didn't matter. I, I was, it didn't, I, you know, it yeah. didn't matter. And, yeah. and, and, uh, and so, it was the last day, and, wow. and I was walking down the stairs, and Bill was standing at the bottom of the stairs at Bryant Park. Wow. And um, he was standing there, and he was, I didn't know, but he was waiting for me. And he said, I just want to say it was a great week. Nice seeing you, Patrick, and I'll, I'll, I'll see you around, kid. And of course. <laughs> the kind of thing was, he said, shake my hand. And he never did that before. Uh, and he no. put the watch in my hand. <gasps> He put the ladybug in my hand to watch. That's my bill story. And I have it. Patrick. Wow. Yeah. So it was special. What, it, just, it means a lot to me. What, what a wonderful human being. We definitely miss him yes. in the fashion community yes. for sure. Yeah. Um, but it, yeah, go ahead. we had a very special connection. And yeah. I believe that. And, and I know, and I've saved, you know, I've, I've correspondence from Bill mm-hmm. and, um, you know, postcards and things like that. He asked for my address once. And so oh, always a Christmas card or an Easter card. Wow. Or wow. This and that. And when I went to California for a while, he sent me a card going, I miss your style in New York. <laughs> right. <laughs> like, you know what? Yeah. I, I, I believe that Bill and I, Bill and I were very similar. Mm. In, in certain ways yeah and um and uh i i i that's that's it but i i miss him uh, i do miss him and, and it was um i think about him all the time yeah i do and i was so unbelievably honored to be his friend and know him we never we always spoke about getting together I, once we had uh you're gonna love this once I, we were going to have lunch together, and we mm. did. And guess where we went? It was during Fashion Week. He wanted to go to McDonald's by, the, by Bryant Park. <laughs> so we went to McDonald's so we could have a hamburger and a black coffee. I love so it. So that's where I had my lunch with Bill, <laughs> but, um, which was quite fun. Oh, and I, didn't wow. have anything. I think I had an order of fries. I didn't know what to have. <laughs> right. and, and then, um, <laughs> but also another fun, one fun time with Bill is that I invited him out to the invasion in the Pines on 4th July and he came. Oh, wow. And he did come and he photographed it. And he had a, he had the best time. He was like <laughs> a kid. He had the best time. Wow. And um, he was a wonderful person. I have that watch in a very special place. Yeah. It's basically one of my most prized possessions. You know, it, it, it's, it's nothing fan, fancy, but it's, it was from Bill. Wow. And it, that means so much to me. Ugh. And he wanted me to have it. And, and I have it. I wow. have it. That is so magical. And when I see the little box it's in and I open it, I open it sometimes just to see it. Yeah. And that's it. Wow. And that's it. That's the story. That's the bill. The most, that's the most to watch is, is yeah. my most cherished story with Bill. But there's a lot of them with Bill. There's, there's a lot. I can only imagine. <laughs> yeah. I mean, he was a sweet, gentle soul. I mean, you have met so many people throughout the industry over the course of your life. And you've also... I wonder if how many would say if they met me. <laughs> <laughs> that's, just, that's, you know, you know, I, a I think question? a lot or, or, or have seen you. Absolutely. Absolutely. Um, (laughs) You're so funny. But yes, like you, you have been a fixture on TV and films. You know, I have to ask, do you want your ashes scattered at Bergdorf's? Um, 
You're like, no. no. <laughs> so <laughs> you, really. you were in that oh, film and it's so funny when I was watching it, like I, you know, I had, I had just moved back. You blink, you'd miss me. <laughs> <laughs> I had just moved back to the DC area and I watched it and just tears just flew down, like just flowed down my eyes because I was like, oh my God, it's New York. It's magical. It's Bergdorf. You know, what are your thoughts? I do on, love Bergdorf. Right. I'm like, ah. Oh, what are your thoughts on retail, like retail right now, you know, especially after the pandemic and, you know, with all of this digital stuff happening, people are, are ordering, ordering more online as opposed to going in person. Like, do you think we'll ever get back there? No, hmm. no, that's a, that's a blunt answer, but no, I, I don't, I don't think that the new generation wants to go shopping They have no yeah. desire to shop um i think it's a dying art i think eventually stores are just gonna be showcases for people to go when they're around to look or people visiting to shop i think that's what they depend on but i think most people that are young just don't they don't want to be bothered which is kind of off the whole idea to have a day of shopping don't you love a day of shopping Uh, i just love a day of shopping don't you love don't you love going into bergdorf and just seeing everything going having a lunch thing Thing yes. that, you know, next thing you know, it, the store is closed, and you're like, "Where did this time go?" Yeah. But uh, it's 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 something that's gone. I wish retail. Uh, I I don't know. The, the bothersome thing for me with uh, retail is and designer clothes and 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 designers and things like that nowadays. I think there's some fabulous things. My my favorite is actually Daniel. Um, Roseberry, oh. uh, Maison Scaparelli. I, I think he's fabulous. I yes. love him. I love. I love the, the surreal. I mean, I was going to ask you I, who your favorites I love are right now. <laughs> yeah, D- Daniel Roseberry is one of my favorites. Wow. Um, I, I think he's great. I think in, in these times we need to be extravagant and, yes. and uh, not. Ex- well, I think we need to help people, but I think we need of to have visual, yes. visual stimulation, stimulation in fashion and um but what what is bothersome is that even though i do like his, his collection and there are other designers that uh, i i do like very much also but uh i love tom brown i i think he does wonderful i love his things uh, tom ford also but uh all the time I, I just i i all the times uh and a <laughs> daniel two toms and a daniel I love it. Isn't that great? <laughs> yeah. I love it. Two Toms and a Daniel. Wow. But uh, uh, I wish there was more women in the design field. I wish there was. And, yeah. uh, and, and there isn't. And there should be. Uh, but I also feel that when I moved to New York, I had uh, lucky to have a parents that let me buy things, a few things that I wanted. But basically... I was on my own after a year or so, and I had to save up for what I wanted. And I could only, but I see something from Jean-Paul Gaultier, who I met years later. He's wow. fabulous. Oh, he's one of my favorites. Uh, Sorry, Jean-Paul. I know you. Love you. <laughs> right. But uh, he is definitely, but that's someone that's not really, have, doesn't have a collection at the moment. So yeah, uh, I, I think he does. He has his couture collection again, right? I, I think so. He showed couture. Did he? I, I thought he, he like there's this whole retirement situation. <laughs> yeah, I think with the Randy one, but didn't he just show couture? I think, I think so. You're right. I think he did. You're right. I think he did, but I love him. I love him. He's a sweetheart. He's a sweet guy. So totally nice. random. And did you see his um the exhibit on his life and his designs at the Palais in, in Paris? In Paris. No, no, oh I saw the one in the Brooklyn Museum. Oh, did they have the facial did they have the projections? Cloak? Yes, yes. yes. Okay, fabulous. so it was the same thing. It was the same thing. Fabulous. Mind blowing. Oh my and I was on my own. I oh. was at the Brooklyn Museum. I was the first one in there. It was one of the person the whole exhibit. It was a little creepy. With those mannequins wow. talking. All right, talking. I was like, oh my alone. God, it's dark. <laughs> and I was by myself. I was in one room by myself. I was like, okay. Oh my okay. goodness. You know? But it's oh like being goodness. in a department store with all the lights on and the mannequins are looking at you. It's true. But, um, <laughs> That's so but, true. Um, <laughs> so what was I, I oh, talking about retail? Yes. This is what I'm saying. When I moved to New York and I could save my pennies for the Gautier jacket I wanted or 
or a Kanzai jacket or a Kinzo or whoever I wanted at the time, I could be able to do that. Yeah. And everybody else that I knew my age could do that too. You only, you couldn't have the whole outfit, but you could have that piece. Yeah. And you were, you cherished that piece and you wore it out everywhere. You wore it to studio, you wore it to the clubs, you wore it out with your friends and you were just really happy to have it. You know, you were just, you just had it and you walked around like a peacock in that jacket <laughs> in, in whatever you bought or dressed or shoes or whatever you had. Now people that are young they're starting out in New York and they can't even live in the city now because they can't afford to live in the city. They, yeah. they commute. But if they're into fashion, they can't buy anything. They can't even buy a jacket. Yeah. It's, it's, it's prohibitive. It's prohibitive. I just, I go in, I see, I turn the price tags over at, at, at stores. I won't say stores because they're all, you know what their stores are. And I'm yeah. looking at jackets for 4,000, 5,000, 6,000, so not 600, 700, 1,000. I'm looking at, you know, thousands of dollars, yeah. thousands, a pair of, you know, everybody's into Gucci. Uh, I loved Gucci when I was in college. So, uh, I and mean, actually, I wore it to uh, uh, my graduation Gucci loafers. But wow. um, back then, I used to wear them when I was in college, too, along with my platform. <laughs> but um, I have to say is that, you know, these kids want Gucci. They want to wear it. They want to dress it. They want to have this and that, that. And I don't know where they're going to be able to get it from. Yeah. I mean, a Gucci pair of loafers are a thousand dollars. Yep. I mean, they do have it, but it should be a little bit. This should be, you know, I don't want to see a T-shirt for eight hundred dollars yeah. with a with a so logo much. on the front. Some are like twelve hundred now. It's crazy. Yeah. I mean, that's crazy. That's like that's almost like that's so. That's that's the fashion community being arrogant. Hmm. And I know that, I know that it trickles down to where the price is determined by the mills, where it's made, the labor, all that. It gets to be yeah. expensive. I understand that completely, but that's everything's got to take a standstill because it's you know everything now is on sale before Christmas. Everything's yeah. on sale before it's the wild. end of the summer, so it's not even what it used to be. So. Basically, all these collections have probably now a four-week window to sell at full price because mm. it's so expensive, because they build in a, a big price, because they want to separate themselves from other designers. They want to be the most expensive because it shows it shows wealth. It yes. shows that I have the best. But that's not the right way to be. I don't think that's the right way to be. That's my honest opinion. It's just not the right way to be. You know, and I, mean, this, I don't think it can, it'll ever change, but I, 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 I want to be able to see young people being able to enjoy it like I did. You yes. know, cherish that piece you have, wear it to death, you know, wear it everywhere. But now, that's now what I do. Like, <laughs> I, that's what I, I do. Know, but you know what? But what if? But I, I, I understand yeah. that. But what if someone like a young kid goes into Gucci, yeah. and and they see they see a Gucci loafer they want, and they know they can never have it. Yeah, they can never have it. Yeah. I mean, I don't like that. I don't like that. You know, what advice would you give a young person, you know, in this day and age as they think about the items they want to buy? Because you're so great at curating your looks and and looking for the quality. You know, what would you, like, what advice would you give them? Secondhand, I think they need to go to resale stores. You know, people change their minds with fashion all the time. A lot of people hold on to everything, but a lot of people don't. Yeah. Especially now, they don't. Uh, there's a lot of fast fashion. There's a lot of people that mix things together, which I think is great. But I honestly believe that you've got to hunt for it. Hmm. It's a hunting game. Think of it as a treasure hunt to someone young. Ooh, treasure, you I love them, that. Gucci, loafers. So this is a fashion treasure hunt. You've got to treasure hunt and look for that. Or you've got to... You know, find out where the outlet is and, and wait till they go on sale when it's really reduced. Then go get it, you know, or keep your eye on it. And then when it gets to be 70 off, yep. you know, <laughs> maybe you can get it. But you know what? It's, 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 that's how it has to be. Yeah. That's how it has to be. But when does the, when does this madness end? I mean, I, I saw a jacket yeah. in the men's department of a store. That was by a designer, I'm not going to say, probably one of the most expensive menswear designers, Italian. And it was quite beautiful. It caught my eye. 
And um, I know it was cashmere. I know it was woven mm. by angels in Italy. <laughs> I don't know what, something like that. But it was 14500 the jacket. Wow. I'm not joking. Wow. It was $14,500. Wow. I, it kind of made me sick to my stomach. It yeah. kind of, because you know what? There's people that can't even feed themselves. You know what? I, 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 I'm not getting on my soapbox about it, but you know what? I yeah. spend money on clothes. I wait till they go on sale. Uh, I, I have a lot of things I've had for years too that yeah. saved. I, 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 you know, I, I put it together my way. Um, I do it. Uh, I'm not as obsessed as I used to be with having to have this and have that like I used to, but um, I'm being more realistic. Mm. Um, but I'm not going out as much as I used to go out either. Yeah. So, you know, but it's like, it's, it's that's, that's why every time you turn around, <laughs> like you, you turn around and you go to a restaurant where, and you think to yourself, just like the $14,500 jacket, you think to yourself, when does the French fries go from $8 to $14 <laughs> for the order of fries? <laughs> You know, I really think it's an indicator of income. I think it's an I think it's an indicator of income inequality and just how that's, you know, the the gap is just widening like globally. And I think that it's that's not, a that's key factor great. to it. That, yeah. Yeah. And the madness not, has to stop good. at some point. It really does. It, it really does. does. It yeah. does have to stop. It does. I don't, you know, I just, you know. To go out in the city just for a regular brunch, it's a hundred dollars. Yeah, it really yeah. is. Basically, it's basically a hundred dollars. Wild, you know. Even though when I was young, like these kids that are in the city, I didn't want to go out at brunch anyway. I wanted to go out at night. But where is there to go? Where are the clubs? Yeah, where, where are the, all the clubs? You know, yeah. they're all. You got to get offline. You know, be online, work online, explore online, do that online. But you know what? Meet people out. Hmm. That's my advice. I, I miss, I, don't they miss that connection? Yeah. I mean, I know you can go online and meet a husband. You can meet whoever you want online, you know, and, and have a romance and do whatever you want. But ooh, I don't think that's fun. I think no. it's more fun to meet someone <laughs> out, don't you? Absolutely. Don't you kind of want to really see what they're like instead of being surprised? It's like mystery date, that game. And you get oh all of a sudden the door opens and oh, the bum picture. I remember that. Oh, my goodness. That is and wild. And it's the bum picture. <laughs> so that would be like, that's a waste of, that's a waste of time. Yeah. That's a waste of time. Oh, you know? my goodness. That is so but, wild. And and just, <laughs> you know, speaking, I mean, I'm just like obsessed with, with your wardrobe and curation. And along those Thank lines, I, I'm wondering, um, like, you have a very distinct style and you mentioned like in the past that people, you know, were like, ah, oh, we don't know what this guy is doing, but now they appreciate the style, but you have held to your, your, to who you are both inside and right. out. So what, what was it that like, what helped you? maintain who you are in the midst of change? Because I think that in fashion and people who are are looking to, you know, learn more about fashion is that there's so many trends swirling around constantly and, and people saying you need to buy this or you need to, you know, buy into this trend or get this latest thing. Like what advice would you give someone? I never did that. Huh? Do what suits you. Do what you like. I mean, I always looked up to, to like, you know, look, for instance, very mm-hmm. camp, but Ann Miller. Look at mm-hmm. Ann Miller. Mm-hmm. She had her big, wild, black hairdo that swirled up on the side. Or she, had a, she had a look. You know, it was her look, but she always maintained the look. Or Joan Crawford had her shoulder pads. She oh, yes, she did. The look. Mm-hmm. Or, or Quentin Crisp had his, his yes. hat. Or Cecil Bean had his straw hat with his suits. They, they <laughs> kept a look. That worked for them. And I always believed in that. I always like something. And I like things that come out during the season. Mm -hmm. I mean, I saw something from the Dior collection. I'd love to have a jacket or a coat. And I do that with like that that purple coat from Saint Laurent. Mm -hmm. I I had to have that coat. I didn't put it with what they showed it with, but I wanted (laughs) that purple coat. (laughs) And, um, but um, I think that, that I, you know what? I'm more intrigued. And I think people are, especially in a city like New York and in Paris, 
the people are more intrigued when they see someone that puts it together original in an original way. Mm. And, um, you know, you can see influences, but I think that that's fine. But create your own look. And I think there's plenty of people that do that. But, you know, I know that there's a, there's a lot of people that just like, oh, I have to have that so-and-so hoodie. I have to have it. I have to have it. I have to have it because everybody else has it. You don't yeah. have to have it. You don't have to have it. You don't. You know, uh, you know, put it together that makes you look good. It's all about, it's all about like, as I've said before, it's like you're a blank canvas hmm. and you're painting yourself with clothes. Some days you feel certain ways so you paint certain ways with mm-hmm. your clothing. Like you may grab that striped shirt and put it on with the polka dot shorts. Yes. But, you know, people might go, ooh, that's awful. But not to you or in a magazine, the exact look because someone saw you on the street in it that way. Wow. But you did it because it was your style. And you know what? I think it always works out for the best to have your own style. Uh, I do. Uh, I, I, and you know, and, and even designers, I think that you, you think about different designers over the years and, and they definitely, you know, have their own style. They have their look. They just have their look. Wow. They do. So and true. Um, I think I think my advice is create your look, create what makes you happy, create your look. Don't listen to anyone else. I know you have to listen to the people that you work for if you have a job, but right. have, have work, <laughs> do your thing. Yes, do your thing. I you love know, that. Take those work clothes off and do your thing. Uh, but I think anybody can wear anything now. I think anyone. So I think, true. Like, <laughs> <laughs> I had a quote once. I quoted in a quote, and I, I, I can't even say. I used to say, "Casual Friday should be banned." I love but it. <laughs> no, 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 it's, it's casual every day. Yeah, it's so true. Oh my goodness, it's casual. Yeah, it's casual every day. You know, I'll tell you quickly. Is that when I moved to New York, I didn't own jeans. I had jeans that I had before in college, like because they're in Malibu, but they were bell bottoms. Wow. And they were fancy French jeans. You know what I mean? But basically, the other pants were velvet bell bottoms and the corduroy bell bottoms and yes. cotton bell bottoms. Yes. Not denim denim. And I didn't wear, when I moved to New York, I didn't own denim until I worked at Fiorucci. But basically, at Fiorucci, I bought like purple jeans. Of course. I bought leather jeans, black leather jeans. And, and, but no one, you wouldn't see, I didn't own a pair of sneakers. I didn't own a pair of sneakers. Yeah. I didn't go to the gym. There wasn't gyms to go to. I didn't go to the gym. I didn't own sneakers. I just didn't. I wore, I dressed, I dressed up. People dressed up. I love the I fact that you say clothes. that, that shopping is your workout. You mentioned in one of your previous interviews. It and I workout. loved it. <laughs> shopping's my workout. You know, those hangers can be quite heavy. <laughs> right. <laughs> and the bags. They can be heavy. <laughs> yeah. But someone said to me, oh, you are such a weakling, Patrick. You can't even lift a 10-pound weight. <laughs> I, I think, uh, but if I gave you huh. if I gave you 20 pounds of Dries Van Noten in a huh. bag, you could carry that five miles. Absolutely. <laughs> I said, that's right. That's right. Oh, my goodness. I love it so much. I love it. Well, oh, the other designer I do love, I like Dries. I love oh, yes. Van Noten. I've heard amazing I things do. from people who have gone to I the shows, you know. Yeah. And it's fabulous. He's great, too. Love him. Wow. I love it. Well, you know, this is a fashion moment, Patrick. And I know okay. you have a million, but what we typically ask all of our guests at the end is, what is one one of your favorite fashion moments of all time. It could be personal, professional, or something you witness. We've obviously covered so many already, but is there another that you can share that was just so magical where you're just like, I love fashion. Um, you're like every day. <laughs> okay. When I worked in the buying office at Barney's mm-hmm. in the eighties, I was an assistant buyer and on Saturdays, the assistants would have to go into the new women's store and merchandise. I merchandised the fourth floor and um, I do that on Saturday mornings and move things around. We carry Georgia San Angelo, who was another one I loved and uh, Alaya and wow. on and on and on, you know, Barney's had great things then. 
And I never remember I got there very early. I had to get there very early in the morning, get things going. And so I could leave early. And um, so the store had just opened and I was moving things around on the floor. And uh, the girls on the floor that worked on the floor and the guy that worked on the floor were in the back opening the register or doing whatever they were doing. And the elevator door opens. And it's Audrey Hepburn. <gasps> and she was wearing a trench coat. And she had the collar turned up on the trench coat, hair pulled back. What color? And what color? What color was the trench coat? Like, like a Burberry trench coat. Mm. And no one was out on the floor. And I thought, well, to myself, I'm seizing this moment immediately. <laughs> so I went up to her and I asked her if she needed any help. So she was looking for something we didn't have. And I made a suggestion for her. And we had a nice little chat. And she thanked me and left. But I think that's a pretty good fashion uh, moment. Oh because we talked about clothes. We talked about clothes. And um, she didn't have time to get anything from Hubert Givenchy. Mm-hmm. For, and it was something spur of the moment she was going to. And she needed a, a, a cover-up for a dress she had in a particular color. And we didn't have it. Wow. So, um, was her skin like perfect? Think, like, was she wearing a light? You know what? She, no, she didn't have very much makeup on mm-hmm. at all. I would say very little, none, maybe some wow. foundation. I don't know. But I really, honestly, she was very natural. She did have wrinkles. She looked great. She was very thin. She had slacks on, not wow. pants, slacks. Yeah. I love that word, slacks. She had slacks on with like a loafer. She had just, it just had style and the collar was turned up on the coat. It was belted, cinched in the waist. And uh, she had a handbag, I think a shoulder bag. And, and that was it. She was on a mission. Uh, we had a pleasant little chit chat about what she was looking for, fashion. And um, she was on her way, but I'll <sighs> never forget that. I, it was meant to be that I was there really early. She got to the elevator. I was standing there. We chatted, we talked, she left. That was it. Wow. But years, but, but during that time, my Lauren and her husband at that time, uh, we went to the Film Institute of Lincoln Center's honor, the honoring of Audrey Hepburn. Wow. And her husband got us great seats and we were there and they showed all the clips from Breakfast at Tiffany's Charade and wow. Funny Face <sighs> and Gregory Peck spoke. And Givenchy was there. That is wild. So I got to see her there. And I also got to see her at the UN. And she read oh, Peter yeah. the book at the UN. Wow. I saw her for that. But, uh, I got, but I never met her during those two things, of course. But yeah. I met her. And I didn't say what my name was. But we, had a, we talked. Of course. We did talk. So we conversed. And that was good. And I think that, you know, I think that she's a, a big icon to everybody. I mean, believe me. One of the reasons I moved to New York was because of Breakfast at Tiffany's when I was a kid. Really? I thought I'm moving to New York. I'm moving to New York. And there were other reasons, definitely, and I've said them before. Yeah. But Breakfast at Tiffany's, when I was a kid, when I saw it as a kid in the 60s, I, I saw that party scene. I thought, whoa. Right. I'm going there. Oh, iconic. I'm going there. Patrick, I'm you have there. so many. Ama- I'm like, who have you not met? <laughs> because it just seems like you just bump and run into all these amazing people like throughout your life. You are blessed. <laughs> the world is small. Yeah. It is small. And I've been, I must say, you're right. I've been blessed that I've run into all these people all my life. I've just, uh, I've seen them. I've just seen them and then feel very lucky, lucky for that. Uh. Because they, a lot of them have been big inspirations to me. And some have not. <laughs> that's another, <laughs> that's know, another story. Yeah, that's, that's another episode. <laughs> yes. But you are, thank you so much for being on the you're show. Welcome. You are truly, you're and I know I say this all the time, we're like, meh. I'm like, you are an icon, Patrick. And, you know, oh, I hope that you. you know that. And, and I think that sometimes, you know, in the industry, we don't always give people their flowers when they're here. And so we would like to honor you and all of your contributions and, and well, just daring you. to be, be who you are and uh, inspire us, inspire us all. Well, thank so you. thank you. 
Thank you. Thank you. Thanks so much for joining me for this week of A Fashion Moment. If you like what you hear, we'd love for you to join our community of listeners and spread the word about the show. We also want to hear from you. Share your favorite fashion moments and dream guests with us by sending an audio clip or email to a fashion moment podcast at gmail.com. Or you can tag us on Instagram at a fashion moment and you could be featured on next week's episode. And don't forget to subscribe and leave us a review and let us know what you think. Until then, see you next time for another fashion moment. Podcast production by Rebecca Rashid and John Taylor Williams. Digital media production by Megan Porras. This recording carries a Creative Commons 4.0 international license. Thanks to Patrick Patrickios for their song, Hot Coffee.